Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Amateur Hour Workshop. This is where we take a look at equipment, tutorials, and how to safely dangle Tom Cruise off the side of a plane. So if you haven't watched part one of our pre-production tips, you can go ahead and click here and that's where we talk about taking your ideas, turning them into a script, and keeping a budget in mind. And speaking of being budget friendly, so in that last episode we went over a few basics, but today we're going to be talking about where you get that money and what you do with that money. For starters, don't invest all of your money in this. It is extremely tempting to go out and buy the latest and greatest thing that shoots 27K and literally makes your movies come to life. On second thought, if you can afford that and you find that, go ahead and buy it. That's probably a good purchase. Now, I'm not gonna get super heavy into what equipment you should purchase. That's actually gonna be our next episode. But it is important to remember that movies aren't just made with a camera. You've got all the stuff behind the camera, such as lighting, audio. But the other thing you need to think about is what's in front of the camera. You're probably gonna need a prop or two that you might have to build yourself. You're gonna need some costumes that you might pick up from Goodwill, but no matter what you get for your film, it's all gonna cost some money. It doesn't matter what resolution you're shooting in, if it's in front of a boring background and you don't dress your set properly and you don't dress your actors and you don't dress yourself, it doesn't matter what resolution you're in, if your movie looks boring, it just looks boring, except in higher definition. So the best advice I can give is spread out your investments. You can always upgrade your camera equipment and your gear behind the camera over time, but you're only going to shoot that film once. So prioritize what you're going to need. Regardless though, don't forget that you actually have to have money to get any of these things. So where do you get that money? Well, chances are most of it's probably going to come from your own pocket. You're going to have to work hard for it. Go out mow some lawns, get down in those coal mines. If you're thinking about doing crowdfunding, we talked about that last episode, and if you're just starting out, our answer was pretty much a big fat no. You kind of need to build up yourself a little bit more before you head that route. So what do you do? Well, you can go around and ask friends. If you're making a film, it's a collaborative effort. That goes for every sense of it, including financials. If your friends are willing to invest in the project with their time, then they might also be willing to invest in it with a little bit of cash, too. Some people might say no, and you're just going to have to live with that. But chances are there's going to be at least a few friends and family members willing to help you out. Your mother did only bring you into this world to give you money, said nobody ever. Well, I did say I'm not gonna get super heavy into the equipment discussion, that's next episode. It is important to remember that you need equipment before you even start. Now, if you're new to filmmaking, you might wanna invest in just something basic like this and maybe one of these for audio. Nothing too crazy, just keep it simple, learn the basics of using it. But if you've been doing filmmaking for a little bit, chances are you might have looked at one of these. That is nice. Look at those curves. Oh. Oh. But as tempting as purchasing one of these is until you actually look at the price tag, you need to remember that you can and should rent higher level equipment if you're looking to use it. Unless you're making profitable productions regularly, you don't really need to go out and buy a red camera and simply owning the gear is no guarantee of making profitable productions. What makes your productions profitable and really go places is you and your skills. So that's just something to keep in mind. On to locations. Okay, so you've got the gear, you've got the money, you've got some props all together. Now, the big question is where are you gonna shoot this thing? And this can be one of the trickiest parts of pre-production. Unless you're shooting everything entirely in your home or in a vacant lot across the street, you're gonna have to ask somebody for permission to shoot somewhere. And there's a good chance that they might actually say no to you. Unless your production company is insured, some people might turn you down. So where do you look? Well, typically smaller businesses are gonna be more willing to open their doors for you because if you're in a smaller town, or even you know a city that has some smaller family-owned businesses, they make the decisions directly. Whereas if you go into a giant retail store, that's handled by a manager who has to answer to somebody else, who has to answer to corporate, who won't care about you or anything you're doing. But when it comes to location scouting, I have two major pieces of advice. One is check your connections. 
and two is make some compromises. If you ask around, you and your friends definitely have some hookups. You may not be able to think of them right away, but the more you kind of take a look at your options, the more you'll discover that you have the resources you need. In the most recent film we've been working on, there was a horror scene that we needed to do, and we needed a good open area to do it inside of a building. Well, we just happened to have a client that is a tattoo artist, and the building that he works in was absolutely perfect for what we had in mind. And because he knew the building manager, he was able to pull a couple strings for us, so boom, problem solved. So that's just an example of how you can find connections and use them to help create your scenes. Just ask around and see what you can come up with. And as far as compromises go, if somebody says no, then you're either going to have to rework parts of the script or you're going to have to find a location that you can make work to your needs. And speaking of making it work... Oh my god! We're having a fire sale! Oh, the burning! It burns me! Evacuate all the school children! Ah! As I keep saying, friends and family members are probably going to be your best bet, especially if you're starting off. But if you do want to go a different route and try to put out a casting call, there are a few options even on a no-budget film. If you're still in school, maybe try putting something out with your drama department. Or you can always try asking around at a local comedy club or improv classes or reaching out to a small local production group that maybe does, let's say, stage plays. If you really want to get fancy though, there are a few online options for you. Stage 32 is a pretty good resource for finding local people to cast and to put out casting calls as well. Not to mention, you've got Craigslist and Facebook and any kind of social media. Not only is social media great for putting the word out, but on Facebook, if you do a little digging around, chances are in your local area there is a Facebook group for casting calls. My point though is that there are probably a lot more options than you think to get the word out. And now it's time for a quick side note. If you aren't paying people anything to be in your film, then you're going to have to work out on their schedules. They're not always going to be free when you want them to be, so make sure that you communicate well ahead of time and work out what you can. Now that you've gotten your casting done, moving on. Uh, we got about three months to get this done, guys, so we really need to buckle down and get started on this ASAP. So who is free this weekend to meet up? Uh, that's the solstice. I'm dating on Wiccan. That's no-go territory for me. Yeah, and I'm going to be poking my eyes really hard to see the face of God. <laughs> If you've got a lot of dialogue, you may want to get everybody together for a quick table read. The most important thing you need to bring to that meeting is a pen, because you're going to be taking a lot of notes, marking all over that script. There are probably going to be a few lines here and there that aren't going to sound quite like you imagine them, and maybe a few scenes that run a little too long. Something important to remember though is that you need to be open to input. There may be a time when your actor notices that your character is reacting in a way that doesn't seem to fit the way they're interpreting the character. It's a good idea to talk it out and see what their thoughts and inputs are because it may open up a new path to you. While you're definitely not going to take all of the advice that people throw out there, if you don't listen to anything, then you might miss out on a great opportunity. Your job as the filmmaker is to make decisions and know the story that you're trying to tell. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, then you have to be able to take your ego out of it and admit that it doesn't work. Remember that everybody is there to make this version of the story the best possible one that it can be. But what if you're not shooting a film that requires a whole table read? Something like an action film with only a couple lines or even a film with no dialogue at all. It's still a good idea to at least meet with some of the cast members individually and go over what their character is and make sure that they have a clear understanding of them and the story that they're telling. Not to mention if you have a fight scene, you'll probably want to do some choreography in advance, or if you want to go over some prop weapons to make sure they know how to use them properly to make it look the best that it can on film. I find this especially valuable for fight scenes because it allows you to plan out ahead of time your camera angles so that you can try and make it look as real as possible. And if you really want to plan out those angles... And then Heimlich comes running forward. I am a cute little bumblebee, here I come! <laughs> this one is an essential for every project and it may not even fit your style of filmmaking. Not everybody does this step, but it can be a useful tool. If you're directing, let's say, and you have somebody else operating the camera, if you want to give them a clear idea of exactly what you're envisioning a camera angle or a specific shot to look like, it could be a useful tool to help communicate that. Even if you're only drawing stick figures, it can be a helpful way to visualize your film or even just break down a complex scene that you need to shoot. And if storyboards just aren't quite your style, then you can always use shot lists like we talked about in the last episode. Those could be a helpful way to keep track of what shots you need and to help communicate that to everybody else. 
So let's see here. We talked about budgets, casting, locations, equipment. I'm missing something. Oh, yes. I'm not going to lie to you and say that pre-production paperwork is sexy or even interesting in any way. Not only is this the last entry on our list, it's usually about the last thing that people think about. It's not one of the most attractive parts of filmmaking, but it is very, very necessary. A few simple forms can really help save your butt. Now, like everything else we've talked about in pre-production, it's not necessary for every single project that you do. If you're just going out and shooting a quick weekend thing with your friends, then don't worry about it. But if you want to get in the habit of doing it, it may not be a bad idea. If it's something that you think that you might submit to a film festival or really put out there, then it's a good thing to know about. So what forms are there that you need to know about? Well, for starting filmmakers, there's really only about three. The first one is the location permit. Whenever you go into somewhere and you say, hey, I want to film here, and they say, hey, I like the cut of your jib, I'm gonna let you film here. Then you're gonna hand them a location permit. Now all location permit really does is signify that they're letting you shoot there, but more importantly, it also includes the fact that you're allowed to use the footage that you shoot there in film festivals, online promotions, whatever you need it for. It's your footage, you can use it any way you want it. So next up, we have cast and crew release forms. Kind of like the location permit, but for people. Whenever somebody fills one of these out, it's giving you permission to use any of their work that they provide for you, be it acting, lighting, graphic design, doesn't matter. They're giving you permission to use it however you need to for that project. Quick story on why these forms are so important. One of our friends who actually runs a large film contest here in Indiana mentioned that a few years back somebody submitted in a short film and when the actor caught wind of it, he said that he didn't give permission to put it in a festival. He was just making it for fun with some friends. Well, the director was able to provide a release form that specifically stated that any of the footage that he captured with that actor was allowed to be submitted into film festivals. Now the last piece of paperwork is a budget report. This one's not really necessary for short, small, no budget films because it's just going to be a blank piece of paper, let's be honest. But if you're making a film that maybe has a couple people investing money in it, it's a good way for you to keep track of the money that you're spending and to show your investors, hey, this is what I spent the money on. I didn't just use it for s'mores because s'mores are delicious and you should make more s'mores. I want to make a s'more right now. It's really late and like three o'clock in the morning, actually probably closer to four, but God, do I want us more. But if you're wondering where to get these forms, we made sure to include templates of them down below in the description and on our website at amateurhourfilm.com. So finally, that's probably just about everything you need to know as far as pre-production. Keep in mind, like everything else that we've said, it's really up to you on what you want to use. You're in charge of making those decisions. And if you don't need some of the things we recommended, well, you don't have to. I don't use everything that we talked about on every single film that we've shot. If you want a few other perspectives on pre-production, feel free to click one of these links from other filmmakers. And uh, I'll just wait to give you a second to make that click. But don't close the video out because I still have like one more thing to say. Done? Okay, let's move on. Hopefully all this information was helpful, and if you liked it, be sure to like and share and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and check out our website, www.amateurhourfilm.com, for some more resources and some of our thoughts on film. But keep in mind that as a filmmaker, you can do anything you want. If it ends up getting the results that you want, just short of, you know, actually pointing a gun at somebody or just being a total jerk the entire time, then it worked. That's really all that matters is that it works and that it looks great and you're happy with it. So until next time, I'm Colin and thank you for watching.